there's no question that the, the world is moving towards, A, number one, evidence-based medicine, number two, specialty care. And Sandy, to your point, I think I read this article, the, uh, there was a, there, I think it was the RAND people looked at back in the 70s, the number of, the number of pieces of information of data that it took to take care of a patient in primary care was like 15. You know, now that number is over 350. Yeah. You can't do it all. But, but, but this is really a nice segue to this concept that I think all of us to some degree have done is the development of specialty centers. I think it started a few years ago when we started, when we had this realization that androgen deprivation therapy, which is sort of the backbone for management of advancing prostate cancer, is yes, it works, yes, it's always thought of the standard, but it is fraught with issues. We get bone mineral density loss, we get pseudometabolic syndrome, we get hyperlipidemia, we get cardiovascular events, we get glucose intolerance, and patients just don't feel good. They just don't feel good. But now that all these therapies, as, as Sandy, you pointed out, we have the ability to at least to be able to manage some of these side effects, particularly bone mineral density loss. And again, it is up to us as the ones that are prescribing it, following these patients, we need to be culpable for the things that we create. So I know, Gary, you've, you've been very proactive at the urology group in really trying to say, we're 40 guys. It doesn't make sense to have 40 Renaissance urologists. We are going to basically filter these patients down. So tell us how you did that in Cincinnati. Well, uh, thank you, Raul. Uh, I, I am going to tell you that, but I do want to give uh, a credit to Neil, who's sitting here in a very serious way, because uh, Neil's probably the most important urologist who has uh, helped all of us understand this disease state of advanced prostate cancer and years ago has emphasized the importance of treating these patients within the urology group. And if it wasn't for Neil Shore's efforts in that regard, I don't think any of us would be having this conversation today and I think the listeners should be aware of the contribution he's made to our field and our patients. Uh, we took Neil's advice uh, to heart and actually had Neil come in and counsel us uh, on the clinical side about how to treat these patients. And then, Raul, we did a couple of things. Uh, we identified um, a way that works for us to find patients who are failing uh, continuous hormone therapy. Not necessarily patients who have metastases, M1 patients, but patients who are on continuous LHRH therapy with a rising PSA, specifically a PSA over two. We have a staff person who follows every LHRH injection given in our practice every month uh, and who understands whether the uh, patient is on continuous LHRH therapy and has a PSA over two, and that patient is identified. Now, we could stop there, but to your point, then we would be relying on 38 Renaissance urologists to know how to manage that patient, and it's just not good care in this emerging complex field when you want to really take on a serious condition like advanced cancer. And what we have done is we have designated uh, five subspecialists or specialists in this area. Uh, they are people who have the ability, the interest, and they're geographically dispersed within our market. And uh, we actually, uh, and this offends some urology practices, we actually change the patient's physician. We take the patient from the doctor who historically treated them and give the patient to the specialist when they have uh, CRPC, with or without METs, because that specialist knows how to scan them and find the MET early, and that specialist knows how to treat them when they need to be treated. Now, you might say, how could we get buy-in for this? And um, the answer is that if you really talk to the physicians in your group and make them understand that this is better for the patient, that you will relieve physicians of a complex burden if they're not interested and committed to this. It's a relatively small number of patients. And frankly, if implemented properly, there's actually a return to the practice on a financial basis by treating these patients. So when the whole thing is packaged properly, in my judgment, and not every group can get there, 
Uh, the patients are best served by an aggressive means of identifying who they are, as I mentioned, and then by having them treated exclusively uh, and permanently by a new cadre of interested physicians. Gary, we, we do it a little bit different. We have not by the physicians, we have by the PAs. Uh, our physician assistants, nobody follows protocols better than a physician assistant. And uh, we found that uh, when we looked at our data and patients who were more on, uh, on more advanced therapies, the ones who prescribed it the most, uh, the most in, the, in the proper situation were the PAs. When we left it to the physicians, as you said, their utilization of these advanced therapies were very low. When you looked at the, at the PAs that were running these clinics in a, in a protocol-driven manner, those were the ones that were on the proper medications. Well, there's no secret sauce to your point, right. Sandy. However it works in your group, That's right. you gotta make it work in your group. Correct. But the overriding principle is that we have to subspecialize. Um, and uh, we have to deliver a, a level of care to the patient and keep these patients in our practice. And uh, there's probably different ways to get that done. But if you're not courageous, if you're not willing to challenge your associates about their level of care and who's going to be interested, whether it's a PA or a doctor, how are we going to get this done? If you're not willing to challenge them and implement new systems, you're going to fall behind. Now, there's no question that there is, again, with the plethora of data over the past four years, these patients, as you appropriately stated, Gary, are very, very complex, and it takes a lot of time, as, as all of us know, and I think there is such an educational hurdle here, and there's an educational opportunity. We really need to do a better job, and l like anything else, you're going to get partners that'll say, hey, I'm happy for you to manage these patients because they are very complex, but then, as we all know, you're going to get about 5 or 10 percent, they're going to say, you know, I can do it as well as, well as Neil. Or, or even worse, send it out yeah, to a, right, other, have your and practice. And the other challenge, Gary, is on compensation. A lot of times the doctors will throw up the compensation model is an issue. Uh, how do you deal with that? Well, uh, I alluded to that. I didn't want to uh, get into too much detail. But frankly, uh, we've been able to demonstrate uh, when we studied this that the average physician in our practice would lose about 2.3 patients a year. And when you look at the appropriate utilization of revenue generating products in your practice. Uh, and, and then better care. And better care. And better care. And then you go back and take that revenue, Sandy, and divide it by all the doctors evenly. They actually come out ahead financially as opposed to losing those 2.3 patients a year. And they're unburdened with this anxiety of having to master this entire disease state. And that argument is the argument that carries the day. Can, can, you know what's interesting about this, you know, bookended here by, by Gary and Sandy, is they have different models, different parts of the country. But what, what was the, 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 com, the, the common ingredient? Innovation and strong leadership. Right. And that's really challenging for physicians in general when you have, you know, we're all alpha males. But when you can get really strong uh, physician and ad non-physician administrative innovation and leadership, that's how you get the change. And if, you know, change is hard. You know, people have won, won awards by writing books about change and innovation, rightfully so. But this is where I believe, uh, and you see gr two great examples of this, is how they're leading urology in the present into the future. And other groups need to figure out how they can emulate those models. Otherwise, we'll be relegated to an old system of trying to be the generalized urologist and miss all these waves of innovation. No, I think, I think that's spot on because as, as all of us, as all of our partners, as classically trained surgeons, it's the old joke. You know, if you ask a surgeon who's the best three surgeons in his area, he doesn't have any problems naming himself. It's the other two guys he can't think of. And again, I think we have to kind of get away from that and say, hey, listen, we're going to practice evidence-based. It's not by how you trained that this is the guideline. And, and again, I think that we have, and you know, our, our, our academic friends are doing, trying to do better jobs, but they're also working with, with community independent groups like us to be able to help them in terms of trying to guide these patients, because there's no question that the bigger community practices, the active people like ourselves are really pushing this, and our model is so different from our academic brethren. They are, more, they are more siloed, and 
it, it, it's a good approach, it works, but I think we are all incorporating this multidisciplinary approach in some form or fashion. It may not be completely under, under one umbrella, but we are developing different innovative ideas, techniques, relationships with colleagues within our own community. And so, you know, one of the